Well, I mentioned last week that we would wait till this week to look at the lessons that we can draw from the Gospel of John. And I think you will realize when we go through these, although, as I've said on all the others, you could find more than what I will list here, but you will see when we go through these just how many lessons or sermons we have heard uh, from John just by noticing uh, these particular uh, topic sentences, if you want to call them that. Uh, there's about uh, 40 of them or so, something like that. Um, in verse 12 of chapter 1, 1 verse 12, uh, you see that there's <clears throat> only those who are willing to receive Jesus can become um, his uh, disciples. I think it's interesting that this destroys the whole idea that at the point of belief and belief only, one is saved without any further acts on that person's part. If you look at verse 12, it reads, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So notice if you received him or believed on his name, that just gives you the power to become. So uh, you can believe in him, and that ties in with James 2, but it can be a dead faith. As I've said over and over again, the devil level of faith. The devils can't deny the existence of Christ and who he is. The demons that were cast out many times acknowledged him to be the sons of God, but they certainly weren't saved. But if belief only saved, they would have been saved. So once you get a person to accept the evidence that proves to them that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the son of God, that just puts you into a position to be saved from your past sins. And that's a very important point to use, and you might keep that in mind in studying with people. Uh, there are other passages like this, but this is uh, one of them right there in chapter 1 and verse 12. Then in chapter 1, verse 29, we see that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world. Um, that fact is being denied more and more. Most of our lives, we have lived among people and we have converted people out of denominationalism, thus out of a belief in God, or not out of a belief in God, but from a people who already believed in God believed in Christ as the only Savior, believed in the Bible as the Word of God, we were just converting them out of a man-made system that's not taught the Scriptures. But more and more today, we're having to deal with people who don't believe in God, who don't believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who don't believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of the Scriptures or the finality and completeness, the infallibility of the Scriptures. So all of these are, are very important. But you must remember that in the first century, this is what the church had to deal with. There weren't any Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Roman Catholics, or anything else around like that. You had Jews who had to be convinced that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Messiah and that they had to obey him. And the rest of the world was full of various sorts of, of pagans. And yet, um, so many were converted. And thus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the way they're written are designed to reach people who are not already believing in God, Christ, and the Bible, and salvation by Christ, and such things. And we are reaching that stage. We've already reached it. You're just as apt to talk to somebody today that has no denominational background. Thus, you can't even assume that they understand the existence of God, and that's more and more. So we need to work on those things and being prepared to deal with them. Um, 
from John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, we find the scriptures saying that uh, Christ knew all about man while he was on the earth. And this ought to teach us, too, that Christ knows what is in the heart of every one of us, even now, John 2, 24 and 25. I think it's hard for us, even though we know factually God is not a man. He doesn't function as a finite human being. He's not a created being. He is the one that created all things. He's self-existent without beginning or end. Yet, when we start thinking about him, we, if we don't watch out, will still pull him down to the level of a human being. But Christ knows all. Whatever's knowable, that's what omniscience means. Whatever's knowable, then deity knows it. We don't have to understand how that's possibility. We just need to accept the fact of the matter that God knows, so does Christ, since he is deity. Everything there is about us, our motives, our purposes, all that there is, he knows. And again, you may ponder it saying, how can that happen? Well, you're not going to be able to ever figure that out. Uh, then, too, we see in the old passage that is so familiar to us, and yet so many people don't really understand the significance of it. John chapter 3, verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that ties in with the same idea that's presented in chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, both of them are saying you must be brought to a proper belief in Jesus Christ in order to be saved by him. And, of course, that harmonizes with Mark's account of the Great Commission, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So uh, one of the things that came out of the Protestant Reformation, uh, a bad thing, was salvation by faith only because they were reacting to Roman Catholicism that is a system of meritorious works. Many times, even today, in thinking of Roman Catholics, we think of them like Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterians, community churches, etc. But they don't. They, they, they are believers in meritorious works. And that's the reason when you've been around them, or if you come from that background, they can repeat something of, seems like it, with no limit on it. Because the more you do something then that's good, as they define good, then the more it um, weighs down the balance of merits on your side. And thus, there was the reaction of the, those who protested the corruptions of Roman Catholicism, 14, 15, 1600s, that they went the other extreme and they declared that it's salvation by faith only. There's nothing you can do to merit salvation. Thus, that means that the only view Protestant denominationalism has of works are meritorious works. That's what's in their mind every time they think of saying work. That's why that uh, uh, Martin Luther did not, well, he had a hard time accepting the book of James into the New Testament canon. He called it a right strawy book. And the reason why is James chapter two. And I don't think he ever did get it straight. Well, I know he didn't when it came to faith apart from works is dead because his view is no faith only will save. So what do you do about the works? That's the reason all sorts, if you get into study of denominational theology, you get in all sorts of um, different views on how you try to harmonize that with the false doctrine of salvation by faith only. Um, I think it's important, we probably don't do it enough, to teach the lesson in the next verse, John chapter 3, verse 17, um, which teaches plainly that Jesus was not sent to condemn sinners, to save them. 
He was not sent to condemn sinners, but to save them. The point is, men were lost already. I've run into this in several places as a preacher in the church, where you have folks talking about, well, it used to be deep, darkest Africa, where the word of God had never gone. Now it might be New Guinea or someplace like that, if there is such a place on earth today as there used to be. And you would talk to some members of the church and say, well, if these people have never heard of God, Christ, the Bible, the gospel, they've ne it's never gone to them. Are they lost? I've had brethren argue with me. No, they're not lost. They've never had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Well, Jesus is saying before he ever came to the world, everybody was lost. All this sin to come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And they don't realize that at one time everybody in the world believed in God. Romans 1 should settle that when it tells us about the Gentiles departing from God because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Now think about that for a minute. To retain God in their knowledge means they once believed in God. They didn't want to keep him. So God making man or having made man as a free moral agent said, well, in this life, which is a life of probation, you either prove to God you love him or you don't, uh, your obedience or disobedience, then he let man go ahead and do what man wanted to do. And you've got the sorry state of the world, Gentile world, as it's pictured by Paul in Romans chapter one. And it's the state more and more of the world even today. So people are lost. They need the gospel. So if they never hear the gospel, they've never even heard of the Bible, they're lost. Uh, if you want to see how false religion can influence and impact a whole culture and country, just look at what the Hindu doctrine has done to India. There is a false doctrine that has influenced that whole country and continues to do so and causes those people to believe all sorts and sizes of things that are so foreign to the Bible about their very nature, about eternity, and so on. Now, how would you like to be in a situation where if you're a, quote, good a Hindu, unquote, then most of the time you're anticipating dying and coming back, uh, the doctrine of reincarnation, coming back as something else. And if you don't live up to the level you ought to right now, you may come back as a maggot. Uh, you may come back as a cow. You may come back as a gnat. You may come back as an elephant. Now, what kind of hope is that? And you don't know how it's going to be. You have no idea. The ultimate desire that they have is to live such a life that they can be absorbed eventually into nirvana, some sort of involved in nature to where they're basically nothing as a person anymore, as we understand the Bible teaches each one of us are persons. And so that impacts the whole of India. And people can talk about uh, how terrible it was under the British Empire and so forth as far as India is concerned. But at least they brought uh, the moral principles of, of, of the Bible. We're not talking about whether they lived up to it or not. They brought the moral principles of the Bible there, and they at least allowed a form of the truth to be there. And nowadays, I understand if my information is correct, in India that um, the New Testament Christianity is in every um, district, or however they call it, um, state of India. That doesn't mean that still the great, great majority are, are not Hindu, they are. But nevertheless, we need to understand that people living in sin takes various forms and can impact every phase of our life. So we need to understand that people are lost before the gospel ever gets to them. The gospel is God's power to save them. Well, it saves those who are already lost. So we go into the world to preach the gospel because people need it. Why? They're lost in their sins.
whether they've ever heard of the God of the Bible or Jesus Christ or not. They're lost. Also, a lesson can be seen in chapter 4 and verse number 9. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this lately. And it was, it was a great big problem in the New Testament church for the first number of years in the first century, especially, but even after that, and that is a racial problem. Now, when we think of racial problems today, we think of it as we've been exposed to it in America. But you must realize that racial problems have been around for a long, long time. Uh, and when you were in the first century and for many hundreds of years before that, uh, slavery was accepted. And not only does it have to be um, slavery, but just social barriers. And we can't allow racial or social barriers to keep us from reaching out and carrying the gospel to people. Chapter 4 and verse 9. Ask yourself the question, would a very poor person economically feel comfortable in coming into the auditorium and sit down with the rest of us to worship God at spring? We ought to, I guess, say bend over backwards, for lack of a better way to put it, to make people like that uh, in their condition feel very welcome. James had a lot to say about that because there were barriers there between wealthy people and very poor people. And James uh, scathingly rebuked those brethren for the way they were treating the poor people from the way they were treating the wealthy people. So we cannot allow uh, social barriers, uh, education barriers, uh, racial barriers. There's all kinds of barriers that uh, allow prejudice if, if we're going to be prejudiced, or bias, or bigotry. We usually limit those to strictly racial things, but that's not necessarily the case. It, we can have those attitudes toward a number of people for various reasons. And again, as I've said, if everybody would do their best to be consistent, honest, and the application of doing unto others as they would be done unto, that would solve a whole lot of things. In fact, I don't know how many things it would solve, but especially these racial and social barriers that sometimes uh, exist. Uh, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. Chapter 4, verse 24. I don't think you can overly emphasize that. That when we, let's just take the first day of the week assembly. When we assemble on the first day of the week, it's for one purpose. To worship God. It's for no other purpose. Now we have, when things are normal, then because we were already assembling to discharge our obligation to worship God in that assembly, then we would go ahead and have Bible classes. But the main reason for assembling on the first day of the week is to worship God as he directs his children to worship him in fellowshipping one another and directing their worship to him as he specifies the acts of worship. And that ought to be the reason we're coming together. That ought to be the principal reason. And uh, anything that handicaps us from that is handicapping our worship of God. And he says in spirit and in truth, well, we must have our mind on what we're doing. We must know in our mind that we're wanting these acts, such as singing or prayer, to be offered to God according to the teaching of the scriptures. So you have the right attitude, disposition of offering our acts of worship to God, but then the truth is there in spirit and in truth. So uh, the truth governs what it is that we offer as acts of worship. A good example of that, Genesis 22, and Abraham, uh, who was commanded to offer his son, son whom he loved, as a burnt offering, emphasizing God did to him that that's his only son. Well, Abraham set about to do that. But he's the only one that's ever been commanded to do that as an act of worship. 
and uh, anybody else that decided because Abraham is the father of the faithful, the epitome of faithful service to God, that he could make a human sacrifice would be just very messed up in his right division of the word and understanding the worship of Christians under the authority of the New Testament. But nevertheless, to worship God acceptably, then we must worship him in spirit and in truth. And in each act of worship, we should be thinking about what we're doing and to whom it is that we're offering these acts of worship to. Now, that, that, that implies some things. That implies that everybody in that worship assembly knows why they're there, those who are Christians and thus old enough to worship, and that they're wanting to create an atmosphere of worship. Now, we know we can't, uh, that babies are going to be babies, and little children, little children. But at the same time, we should be doing all we can to keep an atmosphere that encourages the worship of God, keeping in mind that we're to worship him in spirit and in truth. So there's always something to work on. When you think about where's your mind when you're partaking of the Lord's Supper, how do you what are you thinking about? Because you're to do this in memory of Christ. We show forth his death till he come again. So if we can have a song book to help us to worship God and a song leader, at least get the uh, singing started on the right song and give decently in order to that, then we ought to realize there can be aids to helping us keep our mind where it ought to be when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper. What, what is it that goes through my mind when I'm giving of my means? Well, of course, the purposing of what I give takes place before I ever get that assembly if it's done right. So my worshiping God in spirit when it comes to uh, my offering begins before I ever get to the assembly. So what kind of prayer do you offer? before you, since it's our custom, I have a prayer, before you give of your means, giving cheerfully without grudging, for God uh, loves a cheerful giver. Uh, Christianity is nothing but giving as the Lord directs that giving. That's what it's all about. So all these things need to be there. Whatever you need to do to use as an aid, such as a preacher using notes or whatever to preach from, a teacher using notes, then we ought to use those things to help us center our mind on whatever that act of worship is, as we know in our minds we're offering it to God. And of course, when, when we think of the singing, uh, we're speaking to one another in Psalms and human spiritual songs as we offer that singing to God. So there are a number of things that can make the worship as God wants it to be and to help us worship better in assembly, which is convened for one reason, to worship God as it is on the first day of the week. Then too, in chapter four, verse 35, he talks about the fields are white under the harvest that there needs to be those very dedicated, uh, every member to the best of one's ability to be interested in teaching the truth to others and being a soul winner. Um, you may say, well, today they don't want to listen to the truth like they did way back. But somewhere, in some place, there are people who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. There are honest and good souls. There's times when you must Maybe put forth a lot more effort to find those folks. But if you also follow the sowing of the seed of the kingdom, most of the time over here, well, if you know anything about gardening, we plant in rows. But they did a lot of what would be called broadcasting. You may have seen pictures of the sower going forth to sow. And he's stepping it off, and he's got a bag at his side full of seed, which would be wheat or barley or something like that. And he's broadcasting. And thus, it's scattering hither and yon. And you don't know where it is all going to, 
to fall. And the seed being alive or with the germ of life in it, then, of course, you get some idea how the Lord used what they were used to when he goes into the parable of the soil of the sower and show how when you broadcast where it's going to land. Then he makes the lesson that he wanted to make to the people how that uh, the type of soil is a type of the heart or mind of man into which the seed falls. And the seed can only function as intended when it falls the right kind of soil. And of course, that's the honest good heart of Luke 8, 15. So there always needs to be broadcasting the truth. The truth's only thing of saving God. And as we've quoted many times, old Bro brother Marshall Keeble says, um, you preach it to them when they want it, when they don't want it, because you keep on preaching the truth. So we must be, regardless of the state of affairs, whether it's COVID-19 or whatever's going on, in the state this country's in today, is not any worse than the Roman Empire was in. They had some revolution or some rebellion or some turmoil going on all the time that was having to be put down by the Roman army. And thus, uh, they still went about sowing the seed of the kingdom. If you try to wait till everything is just exactly right in its right place before you begin to sow the seed of the kingdom, you'll never do it. Um, I've never seen it among farmers that they weren't always concerned about too little rain to, or too much rain. It's always that way but it never does stop them from planting their crop. And maybe sometimes uh, the cold comes too early or stays too late, or they have to plant the crop later. But you'll find the farmer always plants. He may be greatly concerned about all these other things. And I've seen it to where so much rain would come, it drowned out a whole crop, hundreds of acres. But if there was time enough and it dried up enough, they sowed the seed again. They, it's hard to call yourself a farmer when you don't plant anything. So we are sowers of the seed of the kingdom. And we don't wait till the weather is perfect before we start. We talk about uh, almost, Agrippa said, that persuaded me to be a Christian. Uh, we talk about uh, I'll call for the when um, I have a convenient season. There's never going to be a convenient season. When someone is convicted of the truth and they're persuaded that Jesus Christ is the Savior and they know what to do to be saved, they're going to have to act on it, regardless of what they've got to alter in their lives and the sacrifices they must make. Because there's never going to be a time when everything will be fine. You'll not have to give up anything. You'll not have to make any adjustments. None of that's there. In fact, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus makes it clear, look, you're going to become a Christian. Then you're going to suffer loss of a lot of things to be faithful and go to heaven. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Uh, we also learn from 4 and verse 45 that a prophet doesn't have any honor in his own country. The more familiar you are with people, the less you think they know. Uh, I don't know why that is, but the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Um, somebody says, the only, you know, you know, what does it take to be an expert? Well, to fly into town and to uh, have a briefcase, and you're an expert. In other words, you don't know who he is. So he's coming in from some place reputed to be a seat of learning. And he comes in and he comes to preach for a week or a day or whatever. And he leaves back out same way. Well, he's a very important person. I must listen to him. But then when you get around him all the time, you find out he's just a person like everybody else. And therefore, you lose respect. It make a difference how much of a genius he is or how much of a hard worker he is or she is. Uh, that's the reason there's so much that needs to be taught on uh, 
husbands and wives getting along with one another. Because believe it or not, the more longer you're together all day long going through whatever there is in the ups and downs of life, you can cease to appreciate one another if you don't adopt the right kind of attitude that God says a husband ought to have to the wife, the wife to the husband. So there's always something to work on. And we must understand that sometimes if we're going to be effective in the work of the Lord, say in teaching, I do better to leave our home country or leave the area where we're known and go somewhere else. Uh, just what are we willing to sacrifice to get the truth out and live righteously? That's what it really comes down to. Um, chapter 5, verse 23, He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father that sent him. It's that simple. If you deny Christ, he'll deny you before the Father. So you, you cannot say, well, I believe in the Father. That was the Jews' problem. They believed in God. Notice on the day the church started on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ that um, what they had to do was be persuaded that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is that Messiah that they had read of in Isaiah, such as Isaiah 53. Thus, when Peter answers the people as to what they ought to do to be saved, he tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that among Orthodox Jews, at least many of them, that if one of their own converts to belief in Jesus Christ as a Messiah, that the Orthodox Jews have a funeral for that person? He is dead to them and they show forth by having a funeral. Well, it costs something to be a Christian. We just haven't experienced that as much in our society as they have a lot of places in the world. Malaysia to this day, it's against the law for a native Malaysian to become what they would call a Christian. And they, they lose all of their rights and privileges. If you go work in Malaysia today, being that it's an Islamic country, when you go there to work, you're working among not native Malaysians. You're working among the ethnic Chinese and certain others that are not native Malaysians. So uh, there's a, a lot that goes along with understanding the importance of confessing with the mouth that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And it's so easy here to do that, but it has not been so and is not so in other places today. We need to learn that it's always right to do good and that some responsibilities take precedence over others. Chapter 5, verses 9 through 18. In other words, it's always right to do good. Do I believe Jesus Christ, Son of God? If you say yes, we're going to shoot you in the head. Do you say yes? It's always right to. So that kind of thing needs to be something we face up to in view of the coming years. I often wonder how, how is the church going to fare in the next 50 years? I know how far down the drain it's gone when it comes to holding the New Testament pattern. In the last 50 years, I've been there watching it and been in the middle of it. But if it's departed from the truth in so many places so far in that length of time, what about the next 50 years? What will your children believe? And as I said many years ago, if the Spring Church building 50 years from now still uses a religious meeting house, what are those people going to believe it, that assemble there? Well, we can't know everything, but we can know what we do where we are today when it comes to those matters. So we do right, and we recognize, too, then, that in doing right, there are some things that are more important to do at a time than others. Um, you see that in the matter of, uh, say, the Good Samaritan. He had places to go, places to be, responsibilities, but he put all that aside to take care of the Jew who was beaten and naked and left for dead and robbed. 
we had often don't think about that, but he had to make some changes in his plans to take care of that man. Yet it was a thing to do. So some things take precedent over others. If you're about to be late to worship and you come upon a situation to where you need to act in an emergency to help somebody, you don't say, well, I can't stop and help, although I'm the first one here and I can do it because I'll be late for church. Well, you got your priorities all mixed up. If that's the case. And you've, you've missed learning what Jesus actually taught in such accounts as the Good Samaritan. Um, he, in, that, in uh, chapter 5, verses 28, verse 29, he points to the resurrection, and he says, there's a day coming uh, when all that are in the graves will be raised from the dead. We call that the general resurrection, where the saved from their sin we raised to eternal life, and those lost in their sins raised to eternal damnation. Uh, God is going to send people to hell. Period. And the New Testament is clear, especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, from the lips of Jesus himself, that the great majority of people who are responsible to God for their actions are going to be lost. Sometimes we don't want to say that, when it may be the very thing we need to say. In fact, I'm quite sure that it needs to be said a lot more than what we do. If you listen to people dealing with their families or close friends, and children or parents or whatever, you get the idea that God's never going to send anybody to hell. Yes, I know I read of it in the Bible. I know that's his word. I know that's what he says. But now really with me, is he going to do that? Is he going to, will he do that in my child? Well, he wouldn't do that in my child. Well, that makes you any more important than anybody else in this world. So he has his standard. He's not going to change it. John 12, 48. So when people are raised, they're going to be raised to eternal life or raised to eternal damnation. And the Lord's not going to budge off of what he says in the New Testament of Christ today. Also, it shows that if you can't accept the Old Testament as being inspired of God, then there's no use saying that you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Look in chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. And that's the very point. Jesus many times, um, I guess you'd say, sanctioned the events of the Old Testament by saying things like, they happened. Not just they could have been or it's just some sort of story. No, they happened. Well, the Son of God said a thing is so. It is so. So when somebody else comes along and says, well, I really can't accept that in the Old Testament, but I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, then you better do some serious heart searching because the scripture says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Thus, whatever is inspired of God is scripture, and both the Old and New Testaments are. And the old preacher said that the Old Testament is the, or the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed and the Old Testament is New Testament concealed. They were making it clear there is a direct connection between the two Testaments. These things written before time for our learning. That's the Old Testament. That's going to help you understand the New Testament. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. All right, understanding the law and the right division of the word and the what it did and what it was designed to do is going to help you understand the New Testament better. So we need to understand that about, about trying to say, well, yeah, I accept the New Testament in Christ, but I don't much believe in the Genesis account of creation. Well, you're not going to be acceptable to God when it comes to that kind of belief. In John chapter 6, verse 15, we should be reminded that Jesus didn't come to be a king on earth. He had the opportunity to do that, but he refused to accept such an offer from the people, and that's recorded in John 6, 15. We need to know that Christ reigns in people's hearts through their belief and obedience of the truth. Thus, his kingdom and the boundaries of it cannot be seen with the 
but wherever men love the truth and from the heart obey it, live by it, then Christ is ruling. And he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Every person is amenable to Christ's doctrine, the New Testament. And we must understand that everybody's going to give an account to Christ on the basis of the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. Even atheists, they're going to give account. Why didn't you use your life to find God? Why didn't you use your life to find Christ? Why didn't you follow the Bible and learn it is the word of God? Why didn't you do what it said? Why didn't you obey the gospel of Christ? Why didn't you live faithful in the church? Why didn't you assemble every first day of the week with the saints to worship God? Well, you say, you can't expect an atheist to do that. Well, of course not. He's not qualified. But God says you're expected to be qualified because bountiful evidence is there to convince you of the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the scriptures, and the truth of what salvation is and faithful Christian living. We also see in verse 27, a little further down in chapter 6, that our primary and fundamental interest must not be food that perishes, but that which abides eternally. Uh, God knows what we need to live this life. He put us in a material world with physical body that has physical needs. But he's also saying, if you give your life totally over to satisfying the physical to the neglect of the spiritual, you got it all backwards. So our lives are meant here while we live in the flesh. The body being a tool is to serve God, is to spread the gospel of Christ. We could say that that could be developed into all sorts of lessons as to uh, people as they go through life and the needs of life at certain times. Now, uh, verse 68 of the same chapter, verse 68 of chapter 6. Only Christ has the word of eternal life. Only Christ. There's no one else to whom we may go. So what does that do to Joseph Smith? What does that do to any other person claiming to have a special relationship with God that nobody else has? I re some of us will remember that back during the Cold War, and I, it may still be this way, I don't know, they had a hotline directly from the White House to the Kremlin. So there wouldn't be any misunderstandings and immediately they could talk to one another. Well, when you see these people, like the late Oral Roberts and these other uh, characters that are on television today that teach the health and wealth gospel, they're claiming a direct hotline to God. They don't need what the Bible says. That's insufficient. And I mentioned sometime back, you know, people say, well, I talk to Jesus all the time. And uh, Jesus talks to me. You know, when you have examples of Christ appearing, let's say as he did to John in the beginning of Revelation, you ever notice it's not just a good old boy sit down and have a talk over coffee. John fell as one that was dead when Christ appeared to him. Um, and Christ was in the flesh, living just like you and me, looking just like any Jew, because he was like any Jew as far as his fleshly body's concerned. Even then, they would notice, his di notice differences in him from other men. He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes and the uh, lawyers and so forth, rabbis. He would do things that would make them stop and wonder at him, which shows you that when one has his mind and body in complete, flawless, perfect control of God, he would be strange to this world, wouldn't he? Well, if you've ever worked in the world and lived a righteous life all day long, and uh, had to make some of the decisions that one who follows the New Testament must make, you'll cause the world to look at you askance. And that's the way it will be when you follow the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth regarding God and living day to day. 
people won't understand why you do what you do. And they'll think you, you're silly in doing it. Since only Christ has the words of eternal life, then he's the only one we go to. People of the world will hate those who speak against their evil works, chapter 7 and verse 7. Might as well expect it. There's no way you can say something and tell a person he's wrong, and if you keep on in that wrong, you're going to lose your soul. And if that person loves what he's doing that's wrong, he's not going to like it when you point out you're standing condemned by God for doing or not doing whatever it may be, as the case may be, what God requires. You might as well just simply say, I'm never going to attempt to teach anybody if you don't have somebody mad at you. Just forget that business. Do your best. Be nice about things, but don't mince words. Tell people the truth. They don't hear it much. They hear everything else. And uh, you just have to be determined to do that. Again, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at what Jesus said. Look at the apostles and their teaching. We're going to have to make judgments at times, but we don't want to make judgments according to appearance. Chapter 7, verse 24. Chapter 7, 24 says we're to uh, judge righteous judgment. That is, we judge according to the teaching of the New Testament. Uh, why do we not use mechanical instruments of music in the worship assembly when it comes to worshiping God in music? Um, because one thing I think or you think, we're judging according to righteous judgment as to the kind of music God's authorized, whereby he would be worshiped. Same thing through the Lord's Supper and the elements of it. And on the first day of the week by the saints and so on we go. And think of how that applies more and more to godly marriages and what they are. And rearing children, how far the world has got away from all of that how strange doing the things the Bible requires in those areas are to the person who is void when it comes to any knowledge of the truth. We have to be, and we're going to have to quit in a second, and then I've got a bunch more here to do, and I just have to let them go. I think this is a good one to stop on. We've got to be more interested in salvaging a soul than punishing a sinner. Chapter 8, 1 through 11. This is where you are to preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. None of that says you compromise the truth. None of that says you have to mince words in stating the truth so people can understand it if they want to. But it does tell us how much we have to bear with one another. How much do you want God to suffer along with you? And you know your own heart, and you know you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know you're laboring to study the Bible and pray, but you also, because you do those things, are very much aware of the shortcomings. So we've got to realize the difference in a stubborn, hard-hearted person who won't repent of their sins and in the person doing their best to do right, such as the prodigal son, and yet makes mistakes. I don't think it's that hard to tell the difference. You see a person who's in error and you visit with them, you approach them like they ought to be. And that person is going to demonstrate one way or the other, his attitude toward the truth you teach him. Now the Lord at times was real sweet and nice with folks. The other times took the hide off. What does that mean? It means he knew the difference in how to deal with a hard hearted sinner who knew the truth and did not intend to change and would oppose those who wanted him to change and the person who just stumbled, fell, and slipped off into sin. Yes, they did it by their own choice, such as David and Bathsheba. But still, they were teachable. It comes down to this. You've got to find out whether a person is teachable or not. Some things take longer maybe at times. But do you see how much this demands that we're working with people all the time, one another, brothers and sisters of the Lord, as well as trying to reach people outside the church with the gospel? You don't know what today 
a person may be completely closed off to hearing the gospel. Five years from now, thing can happen in that person's life, changes his whole attitude about the truth. You just don't know. And because we don't know, we pray about it, we continue to study, we correct our own lives, we're patient, long-suffering with one another, we recognize the difference in a hard-hearted sinner and a rebellious person and a person who's got off into sin and can be led back to the truth. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can't see the differences in that. I don't know what we get out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as the rest of the scriptures that show people's interaction one with another when it comes to teaching them the truth and showing them the way out of error. Well, I can say there's a whole host of other things. I didn't get hardly halfway through, but nevertheless, we'll call her quits tonight. I've gone a little longer than I have ordinarily. Appreciate your patience tonight, and we'll continue with some of this. Uh, I'll see whether we'll go on into Acts next week or continue with some of these lessons, because these lessons go on and on and on when it comes to learning what needs to be applied to our lives and others. Any questions or comments?